Hey guys, um, really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Matthew Iglesias. I'm the business and economics correspondent for Slate Magazine and uh, a longtime partner of uh, New America and, and Future Tense here. I'm really excited to have on, on the panel here two um, uh, economists, both from the University of Michigan. We've got uh, Justin Wolfers here and uh, Miles Kimball over there. Um, to uh, two great thinkers on, on monetary topics and, and economics in general, as well as uh, excellent uh, internet personalities um, who I've, I've learned a lot from over the years. Um, and, uh, you know, interested to, to see what, uh, what they have to say on this subject. Uh, Justin and I were, were just out in the hallway and uh, we're chatting with, uh, with Kashmir Hill, and, and he asked her um, if, if she felt that reporting on Bitcoin was, was reporting on something pointless. Um, so, a rather pointed remark. Um, <laughs> and so I, I guess, you know, maybe uh, turn around by seeing, I mean, I mean is, is that how you see it? Is this, is this a, a lot of hype over something completely pointless? Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we got to stretch it out for like 30 minutes. <laughs> okay, so let's start. I, I am told that to the extent that Bitcoin's anything, it's money. Um, is it that, let's go to our Economics 1 textbook, is it a store of value? Well, it goes from $800 to $75, back to $600, down to $500. That doesn't seem like a particularly reliable store of value. Is it a, uni is it a unit of account? I went to buy a bagel this morning, and my bagel said it was one US dollar and 50 US cents. It was not labeled in bitcoins. Um, and is it a medium of exchange? Uh, I've been, Kashmir is the only person in the world who's managed to survive a week <laughs> spending only bitcoins. Um, for the rest of us, when it comes time to buy a bagel, it turns out the bagel shop accepts US dollars and it doesn't accept bagels. It doesn't accept bitcoins. Actually, bagels would be helpful. Um, that really is a store of value, a unit of account, and pot potentially a medium of exchange. So as far as bitcoin being money is, I think it's so far been a, a total failure. Um, as, and, and then there's this... And, 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 there's an enormous amount of enthusiasm around it, which I think is sort of sociologically interesting, and as an economist, I don't understand, in that we face many, many deep, important problems in monetary economics, most of which have to do with trying to get the unemployed back to work, and instead we spend lots of time thinking about, uh, 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 people in the media particularly spend a lot of time thinking about a tiny cryptocurrency that appears to be backed by nothing but libertarian exuberance. Um, so I, I just don't see the story here. <laughs> All right, there you go, there you go. And, and now, now, Miles, I, I, I mean, you've thought a lot over the years, I mean, I mean since going back to, to sort of before this surge of, of Bitcoin enthusiasm about the sort of the larger question of, of electronic money and, and digital currencies, and, and does that mean, do you see some, some important promise Oh, here? absolutely. I mean, so, so the, the story really goes back to, um, to 1932, in the middle of uh, the, the Great Depression, that a guy named Robert Eisler realized that they, they could get out of the Great, uh, Great Depression if they distinguished between bank money and paper money. And that also would have helped us avoid most of the Great Recession as well if we had had that set up. So imagine a world where, and it is gonna be a world that still has lots of problems, but a world where we, we don't have any inflation, where we have recessions that are short. By the way, we, we kind of had that situation of recessions being short between uh, 1985 and 2005, so I'm not talking about something we haven't experienced there. So you have a, a tamed business cycle, you have no inflation, you do it without having to run up deficits to stimulate the economy, you do it in a way where you can have, uh, you can have financial regulations that that keep banks honest so that they're risking their own money without having to worry about having enough aggregate demand. All of that's possible if, if, we, if we distinguish between electronic money and paper money and, and are willing to allow interest rates to run the full range from substantially positive numbers to substantially negative numbers. So that is a change in the kind of system we have, but, but the, the, the unwillingness to go to negative interest rates and the paper money that uh, helps undergird some of that un unwillingness really causes us lots of problems. You know, so if you imagine back in uh, early 2009, if the Fed had gone, suppose you hadn't had an issue of paper money and the Fed had gone to minus 3%, minus 4% interest rates, 
uh, with negative 4% interest rates, by the end of 2009, you would have had a very strong recovery. What we've suffered with this great recession is because of having interest rates not be able to go negative. Now, why is that? It's because we have these green pieces of paper that promise a zero interest rate. You can, you can take all the pieces, green pieces of paper out of the bank you want, hold them any period of time you want, uh, deposit them back again at par and get a zero interest rate. So this paper money is kind of killing us. Now, we don't have to get rid of paper money, but we have to subordinate it to the electronic money. And the more people love electronic money, the easier that's going to be. And that's what I think the importance of Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is just showing how enthusiastic it is possible for people to be about an electronic money that really works. In, in some ways, M-Pesa is an even better example, because there you don't have the sort of... Uh, whatever, a millenarian enthusiasm going on. People just use the M-Pesa in a very practical way. But if you can get low transactions costs on electronic money, get some disruptive innovation there so that people aren't paying, you know, what, one and a half percent credit card fees and everything, and they can do transactions easily, then uh, people will come to love electronic money, and it won't be hard for them to consider that the real thing. And the more people love electronic money, the easier it is to subordinate the paper money and say, OK, look, we're no longer going to have a guarantee of a zero interest rate on paper money anymore. Paper money will, will sometimes have a negative interest rate as it gradually depreciates uh, for short periods of time relative to the electronic money. But if the paper money just isn't that important, if electronic money can become in people's minds the real thing, then this becomes politically possible. People now think this is politically hard, but it gets easier every year that people love electronic money more and more. Yeah, can, uh, let's let's try to, to break this down to make sure people understand because I, I I know it's a it's a it's a difficult subject, um, but but the issue that, that you're pointing to is that traditionally the Federal Reserve conducts monetary policy by sort of fiddling with interest rates. Uh, you know you want to stimulate the economy, you cut rates, uh, you want to curb inflation, you you raise them. Um, but since 2008 2009 or so, they've been stuck at a at a, at a lower bound. They feel that they can't go below zero. And so instead, we've had quantitative easing and, and fiscal stimulus, these sort of unorthodox uh, sort of measures. And so your view is that, is that this is basically a problem of paper. Yes. And that if we can get people to use a convenient all-electronic money system, then we could, we could go much lower. Absolutely. You can keep the paper around. But, but you know, the paper would be marginally less convenient, though, as far as the the uh, interest rates you'd earn on the paper money, it would actually be better than now. It would be marginally less convenient. But if you can get people to not say, well, this is the real money, but say that electronic stuff is the real money, you got a lot more flexibility. And the reason you have more flexibility is because you know, numbers on a computer have a lot more versatility than pieces of paper. But so this speaks, I think, to the sociological point that, that Justin was raising. Uh, because, because you're talking about the advantages of that sort of taking, taking uh, digital money in a more stimulative direction. Uh, but it seems to me that the enthusiasm around this uh, tends to come from the opposite side of the, of the spectrum. Yeah, I want to draw a distinction here between I agree with everything that Miles is in favor of, always, under any conditions, um, <laughs> and Bitcoin. Um, so Miles is in favor of monetary innovation. And that seems to be wildly important. I can think of three important reasons to be in favor of monetary innovation. One, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, people sending money to each other over their cell phones is, is banking the unbanked. It seems incredibly important for, as, as, as a way of people saving and also transferring money in, a, in an efficient manner. And um, more innovation, it gives more of the world access to the banking system is a good thing. Um, two, those of us in the first world instead have a, a slightly different problem, which is the that you know, we're using things like PayPal or American Express or Visa instead for most of our transactions. Um, those transactions, of course, they're taking a huge chunk. It's an impossibly uncompetitive market. Um, and we were, you know, every time you use your American Express, the poor shopkeeper's paying four cents on the dollar, and that's, that's, that's a, a real source of inefficiency. And the third one is the one that Miles is worried about, which is uh, monetary policy, which is as long as we have um, paper money, it's very difficult for us to engineer negative nominal interest rates. There are actually ways we could do it, um, but uh, it would be very difficult to engineer negative nominal interest rates and therefore we lack enough flexibility. The problem with Bitcoin is Bitcoin doesn't address any of these in any particularly direct way. Um, 
I think the most, there, I guess there is a sense in which um, potentially it would lower fees. Certainly some competition would be helpful um, there. But in terms of the monetary policy thing, because it was set up by gold bugs and uh, libertarian zeal, um, the money supply in the long run is going to be fixed. Um, which means that you're replacing Janet Yellen as, a defen as the defender of the purchasing power of your dollar with Satoshi um, and, and a bunch of computers. And I know that in certain circles it's unfashionable to say it, but I think that Janet Yellen is a very fine economist and the Federal Reserve has done an outstanding job in not debasing the currency and I certainly trust that to occur going forward. And I think the, the Bitcoin proposal in particular is one that would actually cause more monetary disruption rather than less. The one thing, I agree with everything you said except for one thing, which is, actually this is what Matt said, this is not a matter of looser monetary policy. It's a matter of, of, of the right monetary policy. And in particular, um, electronic money has the potential to bring down inflation to zero forever. And, and the reason is an important one. So y monetary policy is hard. Uh, you know, maybe someday some, some artificial intelligence will be able to do, uh, to, uh, monetary policy well. Satoshi's Bitcoin algorithm is not that artificial intelligence that will do a good job with monetary policy. So as it is now, you need something big like a central bank with, with many economists figuring things out to do good monetary policy. Now, in those central banks, um, they've decided to have inflation. That's a conscious decision on the part of central banks to, to have inflation. Indeed, not only is this a conscious decision on the part of the Fed, and Ben Bernanke has said as much, on the part of the ECB, Japan, which has had zero or negative inflation, has decided it wants very much to get 2% inflation. Why? It's because they want to have leeway on monetary policy. The interest rates that matter are interest rates in comparison with inflation. The, the higher inflation is, the more stimulative a zero interest rate is. But you don't need to do that. You don't have to have 2% inflation to have the stimulativeness of zero, in, zero interest rate 2% two per, two below where inflation is. You can have zero inflation and minus 3% interest rates. If you, if you can go to negative interest rates, which as long as you can demote paper currency, you can keep the paper currency around, but you've got to demote it from its current privileged role. If you demote paper currency, you can have negative interest rates, then there's no reason, no good reason not to have zero inflation. So you can have what the folks who are talking about Bitcoin say that they want, which is a stable standard of value. Believe me, Bitcoin won't do that. Bitcoin is going to have this fluctuating value. It's going to have a lot of deflation sometimes. It's going to have inflation other times if you try to view things in terms of Bitcoin. You need somebody like uh, a, a central bank that can stabilize the value of the dollar, and they would. If they had the ability to go to negative interest rates, the, the Fed and other central banks around the world would, would wind up choosing a, a zero long run inflation target and you would have the stable value of currency that people want. And I think that's very valuable because this is like a yardstick. You know, it would be very inconvenient, as Greg Mankiw says, if uh, a yard were 36 inches one year and 35 inches another. You want to have a stable measure with your currency so people can think about, say, retirement saving carefully. And that would happen. As soon as we demote paper money, and, and get used to the idea of negative interest rates, the dollar can be a fixed yardstick and you'll get what these folks want. It's not about monetary policy being easy, not about monetary policy being tough, it's about the right monetary policy and a stable value of the dollar. So you mentioned uh, gold bugs, Justin. Yes. Um, and you know, I think, I think enthusiasm for gold is something that puzzles a lot of economists. Um, at the same time though, it's, it's something that's very real. I mean, you could have said sometime in 1987, well, what's with all this gold? But, you know, 20 years later, people are still, are still buying and selling it. I mean, do you think that, that Bitcoins can, could have an enduring role in that same kind of way that precious metals have? Yes. Um, and so that's where I think you're absolutely right, Matt, to say that this is an important area of study for sociologists. <laughs> Um, but while the long-term prospects are that it's going to be an infinitesimally small part of our economy and have no important macroeconomic consequences, then real economists should be focused on, real infla on actual inflation and actual unemployment. I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> no, see, I'm, you, you guys, you need to disagree. Otherwise, there's no, no. There's, there's, there's no there. panel. Well, to, I, I, I can try and 
I, I'm going to disagree with something Miles said by explaining what he was saying. Um, <laughs> but I want to just explain it more graphically. So here's the, the great problem, according to Miles, that we face is the Fed couldn't lower interest rates far enough to stimulate spending enough to get us out of the economy. Greg Mankiw, in fact, came up with a very clever, and, and the reason is that you can just hold on to your dollars, which is a zero interest rate bearing thing. Greg Mankiw actually came up with a very clever approach. But what we could do instead is the Fed could announce, as of today, as of next week, every dollar bill whose final serial number ends in the number 47 will no longer be currency, right? And then they could threaten to do that the following week and the following week. Well, all of a sudden, what you've done is you've made it much more, uh, you really want to get those dollar bills out of your wallet today rather than leave them in there tomorrow because tomorrow they could be worthless. Now, the problem with this is that when Greg suggested this, he got more hate mail than he's ever received in his career. Um, <laughs> so this doesn't seem like a, a politically saleable idea. So what Miles has done is he said, what I want to do is I want to do that, but I don't want to burn the dollar bill in front of you because you'll get upset about it. So what he wants is to put all your wealth in bits and bytes, and then just every bit or byte that ev every balance that ends in 47, he's just going to like delete that away, um, and then that's going to give the Fed the possibility of, of, of doing something to the economy. I, it's a much starker way of describing what you're talking about. Mm. I think it's accurate. I'm entirely in favour of it, um, and so maybe there's this other question, which is why are people so much against it? Well, I, I think I think there really is a political path to this, and and one of the reasons is because. There are a lot of countries in the world, and, and once one country does it, they are going to have a big advantage vis-a-vis -vis the other countries. The, the, the other thing is that um, the Fed actually has quite a bit of courage, and uh, they, you know, they can do things that w are good for the economy even, even if people complain. So, uh, you know, and for example, um, you know, they're... There are things that people should be doing now to prepare for this eventuality because I think it's something that's very attractive to central banks. For example, uh, the standard boilerplate for debt contracts should absolutely have clauses saying if ever the value of paper money is, is lower than the value of an electronic dollar, then we want you to pay the value in electronic dollars. It's a mistake to be writing debt contracts without that kind of provision now because Central banks aren't going to do this, are going to do this someday. I mean, here's a case where it's very easy politically. You take, you take a country like Brazil that's, that's been running 7% inflation. It decides it wants to get its act in, in, in order and, and bring its inflation down to zero. They can put in place as part of that transition from 7% to zero inflation these, these, uh, this subordination of paper currency that will allow them to stabilize the economy with monetary policy. Uh, a, at, uh, at zero inflation. If, if you do this, nobody's going to say, oh, this is, this is some way of having loose monetary policy. This is part of an appropriate transition from 7% inflation to zero. And, and it's just good housekeeping for Brazil when it does decide to go from 7% inflation down lower to do something like that. But I don't know, did, did you see any of uh, Janet Yellen up on Capitol Hill this no. morning? It, it was very difficult for me uh, watching that to envision some future poor Fed chair, chairman or woman uh, up there before the committee trying to explain why her policy was to take the money in people's bank accounts and, and make it vanish with negative interest rates. That, you know, the, the level, I, I mean, if the impediments are political, the impediments are political. You seem to feel that they're that they're really technological, but I think Justin's point oh, no, is no, that no. you know you you could do this with with analog currencies, and, and we don't because people people won't stand for it. No, no, no. Of course, the big issues are political, but al already you see central banks who are willing to go to talk about going to mild negative interest rates. I mean, you had Switzerland back in the 70s do that for a brief period. So central banks already are willing to contemplate going to negative interest rates. And of course, people get upset about that. But it's not a political unwillingness to go to negative interest rates. It's uh, that you have these technical features that cause extra problems that are not a necessary consequence of negative interest rates. I, th I think you're missing Matt's, 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 Matt's point here. So the question is not which side of the technocratic center thinks this is a good versus a bad thing. <laughs> Matt's point is that you can run for president from one of the two major political parties with in the Fed being one of your major planks and at various points actually <laughs> lead major public opinion polls. And so that's a political reality which I think actually the mainstream of technocratic economics, your point, needs to take a lot more seriously as well. Yeah, but think of why that happened. That happened because of the Great Recession. 
It's right. because we had the Great Recession. So if instead you'd ended the Great Recession by the end of 2009 with negative interest rates, you, you wouldn't have had that happen in the, political, in the presidential election. I think now it's time to uh, take the temperature of the political realities in the room, um, see if, uh, if people have any questions. And we have a, uh, a microphone there. So raise hands. No? Really? Okay, here we go. Here we go. Who says that there is no negative interest rate Who today? Uh, Andy Dervish, I'm with the World Bank. Uh, so how, how do you measure negative interest rates and why do you think uh, just simple uh, debasing of the currency is, no, no, not, no. Well, the simplest, is not negative interest rate? The simplest version of a negative interest rate would be this. So suppose, what, what would I mean by a negative interest rate on a three-month treasury bill? I mean, as it is now, uh, if you if you have, uh, if a $10,000 three-month treasury bill costs, uh, you know, 9900 9, then it's going to go up 1% in, in three months, which is an annualized interest rate of 4%. If you had a three-month treasury bill and people were willing to pay, um, to, you know, 10100 for it, and, and then they get back the face value of 10000 after three months, that's a minus 1% over three months or minus 4% over a year. So if, if it weren't for paper currency, through, then through ordinary open market operations, the Fed could buy treasury bills until the price of a $10,000 treasury bill was $10,100. And that would be a negative interest rate. And that would be very, very stimulative to the economy. Minus 4% is probably too much. I mean, by, by the time you get down to minus 2%, the, that's going to be very, very powerfully stimulative to the economy. But negative interest rates are, are just when you, the, the value of the loan at the beginning is greater than the amount of principal paid back at the end if you have just a simple uh, you know, payment at the end. And then it's a little more complicated if you have coupons in the middle. Hi, my name is Carter, Carter Doherty. I'm a Bitcoin boy at Bloomberg News. Uh, and uh, two quick comments. Um, one, I, I couldn't on the uh, the question of this this notion of hardwiring inflation into the currency. It took me a while to find it on the phone, but actually, uh, some years ago, I did write a story about this. There are experiments like this going on in continental Europe, the sort of the creation of of these currencies that depreciate automatically over time. Uh, they take their inspiration from a German uh, economist named Silvio Gazelle, who I believe, if memory serves. Uh, got some approving nod from Keynes in one of his works. I don't precisely remember which one. Um, the second point I wanted to make um, more of a challenge is uh, I wanted to suggest the next time you talk about digital currencies, you spend less time destroying a straw man, which is you've spent a lot of time talking about the, uh, I believe it was libertarian fantasies or some, something to that effect. Zeal. Libertarian what? Zeal. Zeal, there you go. Then there's plenty of libertarian zeal. There's no doubt about it. If you look, however, at where the money is going in, in digital currencies, uh, the investments in venture capital, um, and what I'm told will come off the sidelines once the regulators get their stuff together, um, it's all about Bitcoin as a payments technology. Nobody is spending venture capital to try to end the Fed or end the ECB or Bank of Japan or whatever. It's all about the technology. Um, I may get a little, a little bit of trouble with, uh, you know, my friends from the Mercatus Center over here, uh, but uh, you know, the people, the people who go on with the libertarian fantasies at these Bitcoin conferences that you attend, they get a lot of applause. I don't think they're making very much money. Okay, so if you, I, I take your challenge seriously. Let's follow the money. That's easy. The greatest currency and the greatest payments technology in the world is the U.S. dollar by about 750 million orders of magnitude. So the rest of it's just a sideshow. But the sideshow that uh, costs 2%. I mean, Mark Andreassen, Mark Andreassen, you know, invest $50 million and I meant to care because. I mean, it's, it's a tiny part of the economy. Well, let's, uh, let's get some libertarian zeal yeah. from uh, Eli. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, Eli Dorado from the Mercator Center. Uh, Miles, it seems like at the core of your proposal is actually not negative interest rates. It's separating the unit of account from the medium of exchange. Well, so that's what allows negative interest rates. Exactly. So, so 
why not do that with Bitcoin, right? We could define a new unit of account, call it, you know, maybe a trillionth of nominal GDP, maybe we could call it a Sumner, um, and then we uh, just let it float against Bitcoin, and people, people use, uh, use Bitcoin for, as a medium of exchange, and we have this, uh, you know, ideal unit of account that uh, addresses all nominal fluctuations. Well, we have automatic monetary policy. Uh, why aren't you excited about Bitcoin if we could do that? Well, I mean, there's just, there, there's not, I mean, anything can be a medium of, of exchange. The, the key thing is the unit of account. And the unit of account is what you need to have careful monetary policy about. You need to keep a stable unit of account, and then, you know, there, there's some short-run things you need to worry about in order to stabilize the economy. Then over longer periods of time, you want it to have a stable value. But ultimately, the, the key is to realize that, that we need to have a stable unit of account, but all the other mediums of exchange, and here the paper dollar would be a, a, a subordinate medium of exchange. You could have bitcoins too. It's not the medium of exchange that's the key role of money. The absolutely central thing about money is the unit of account function, and that's what central banks need to be in, in charge of. And you need to make sure that nothing gets in the way of that. And you need to make sure that you, you, you've got to take away this, the, the, this, basically we now have a government guarantee of you can have at least a zero interest rate. You have these green pieces of paper. We've created this government guarantee. It's just like milk price supports. If you say we're going to guarantee that the price of milk is at least this high, it causes problems and we end up throwing away a lot of powdered milk and so on. Uh, and, and similarly, if you, if you willy-nilly create this guarantee that interest rates are always going to be at least zero, that kind of government guarantee is going to mess a lot of things up. One more, one more question. One more question. There in the back. Let's <coughs> Hello, my name is, ooh, that's loud, Michaela Trigilio. I'm an analyst with Treliant Risk Advisors, and I have sort of a two-part question. The first is, if we take your premise that this is the direction that currencies are moving in, what sort of timeline are we looking at for the sociological changes to take place? Um, and my second question is, if this does take place, what would be the implications for cross-border transactions if some countries adopt a digital currency and others do not? Okay, th those are really Thank interesting you. questions. So first of all, the, phase one is to get people excited about the electronic money, and I think that's, that's proceeding. And so if you, the more you can get people to do electronic transactions, that's uh, the better. So I think we have some years yet to run with that. I do think that there are a lot of regulatory and commercial law things that people should be looking at. Like, like I said, people should absolutely have the boilerplate debt contracts say, if ever the value of a paper dollar is different from an electronic dollar, the amount you need to pay me is this many electronic dollars. That should be starting today in the boilerplate debt contracts. But as far as, uh, now as to your other question about the international things, what happens is uh, now if one, one country's central bank lowers interest rates, then other countries' central banks uh, will typically try to follow down. But suppose most countries are, you've got a bad recession, most countries are at zero interest rate, and your country is the one that can go down to negative interest rates, then you're going to get more powerful monetary stimulus, and it's going to stimulate capital flows and net exports. And you're going to have to warn other countries that, hey, we're going to a system where we don't have any zero lower bound. You should be prepared, too, because if you haven't gotten rid of your zero lower bound, too, then when we go to negative interest rates, it is going to take away from your exports. That's not our intention. Please, you should eliminate your zero lower bound, too. And then if you get to that point and you've got to go to negative interest rates and the other countries can't, you say, we've been warning you for years and years and years that you should have eliminated your zero lower bound too. We got to do this to stimulate our economy. And you know, definitely if you want to try to cancel that out with a, with a huge exchange rate intervention, that's fine with us. We're not doing this in order to uh, goose our exports. We're doing this to stimulate our economy and we're happy. We're, we'd be more happy if it were in, in just investment within our country. Mm -hmm. That's what will happen if you eliminate the zero lower bound, too. I think we're, we're at our time bound. Um, so thank you both. And thanks, everyone here. <laughs>